to you, and I miss you, and I miss you, and to you, and I miss you, and for Dean. Shan to you, and I miss you, and I miss you, and I'm the heck of a culture. Rango, Kali, Kali, this Rango, Kali, my party. Rango, Kali, Kali, this fucking old water, some mother. Shan to you, and I miss you, and I miss you, and to you, and I miss you, and for Dean. Shan to you, and I miss you, and I miss you, and I'm the heck of a culture. I'm gonna miss you, the hustle, the hustle, I'm gonna miss you, the hustle, I'm for Dean. I'm gonna miss you, the hustle, the hustle, I'm gonna miss you, the hustle, the power. Shan to you, I'm miss you, I'm miss you, Shan to you, I'm miss you, I'm for Dean. Shan to you, I'm miss you, I'm miss you, I'm gonna take a big hug too.
Ist hier noch Ton drauf, wunderbar. Hallo, das ist die zweite von vielen Ansagen heute. Ähm, da wir den Raum hier morgen ja nicht haben, hier ist eine komplett andere Veranstaltung. Es muss heute Abend alles abgebaut werden. Der Raum muss, wie, also nicht nur dieser Raum, alles muss wie neu aussehen. Das heißt, es werden ganz, ganz viele helfende Hände für alle Arten von Abbau gebraucht. Es haben sehr viele Leute in den letzten Tagen Hilfe angeboten. Heute Abend ist die Zeit, die erst einzulösen. Wir brauchen ganz viele Leute, die beim Abbau helfen. Ist das übersetzt worden? Was das translated into other languages? Okay, it has been translated. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Can I ask the panelists of this panel to come up the stage? I cannot see anyone other than Harriet. Hi. Okay. I, I think you... Yes. 
Uh, yeah, I think it's work. Welcome everyone to, uh, we're going to be strict with time uh, following Havin's uh, <laughs> general <laughs> uh, recommendation because we have to go through a lot, as you know. Uh, Havin's coming on stage. No, she's not coming on stage. Um, <laughs> welcome to the first panel of, of uh, the fourth conference, um, Challenging Capitalist Modernity. Uh, if you had a chance to look at the program, you'll see that one of the main conceptual frameworks that shapes uh, this version or this year's conference is to discuss and resist capitalist modernity as a multi-site regime. So today we're going to start, our first panel will be talking about ecocide as one fundamental aspect of capitalist modernity. Uh, we have um, we actually have five speakers on the panel, but one of them is on their way. Um, I will briefly introduce all speakers uh, as uh, their turn comes up. Uh, my name is Ben Yakbut. I will be moderating, uh, mostly keeping our speakers in check in terms of time. And then when we have question and answer, uh, I will be moderating that part. Um, so we'll start with Nejmetin, who is uh, replacing Darya Akyol on the program because Darya couldn't make it. Uh, Nejmetin Turk is a PhD student at Hamburg University and he is a member of the Mesopotamia ecology uh, movement. And we will be hearing from Nejmetin first. And just a note to the translators, all the speakers will be speaking in English. So the translation will be from English to other languages. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming our speakers and Nejmetin. Rojbaş, evvel enerji, mivan enerjiz, ezbemya, beser navi, rexna, ekoloji, mezopotamya, bedulujan, selav dekem, unemu khiratin. Our comrades and uh, colleagues from North Kurdistan prepared a report about the systemic uh, ecocidal policy of Turkish state, and I will share this report today uh, with you. It is a little bit long, I beg your pardon. Ecocide defined as an extensive damage to destruction of or loss of ecosystem of a given territory, whether by human agency or by other causes, to such an extent that peaceful enjoyment by the inhabitants of that territory has been severely diminished. From an historical point of view, hierarchic and state-based political systems have developed a hegemony over nature, exploited it extremely, and destroyed the earth. These actors have legitimated and marketed their socio-ecological destruction under the banner of development and economy, through accumulation, dispossession, industrialization, and unlimited consumption. The forests have been plundered, the river's flow has been blocked or diverted, and agrarian land has been dried out or lost its richness. Urbanization without planning or weak social ecological criteria also destroyed nature. The systemic destruction of nature of Kurdistan has much more serious dimension than in many other countries. For nearly a century, a systemic ecocide policy has been carried out against the Kurdish people and their geography with a concept intervened with military, economic, and socio-political aspects. While the Turkish state in North Kurdistan uses different tools and methods to force the individual into the triangle debt, exiling prison, the aim towards the society is to displace it from its homelands by enforced displacement and evacuation of villages. After 2015, the state started to destroy Kurdish geographies, including urban areas, if the population couldn't be displaced by force and repression. Over decades, North Kurdistan has experienced destruction of its nature with its small and bigger ecosystems and elements by economic exploitation through dams, mining, different power plants, roads, industrial, mono-agriculture, and cutting of forests that lead to irreparable destruction at large scale. In the last years, 
with the destruction of several cities, killing of thousands of people during the self-governance conflict or semi-quasi-civil war, and with the arrestment of thousands of political activists and elected politicians, the forced occupation of almost 100 municipalities by trustees, the ban of hundreds of civil society organizations during the afterwards following new totalitarian regime. North Kurdistan has been faced systemic social and ecological destruction or policy of genocide, ecocide nexus. The ecocide policies and methods are implemented by the Turkish state in North Kurdistan have been designed to distract socio-cultural and foundational elements of the Kurdish people as we state following. Concerning water policies, North Kurdistan consists mainly of Upper Mesopotamia, where human life has been developed along rivers like Urufas and Tigris. Since 70s, in accelerated way since the 90s, the Turkish nation state built dozens of large and hundreds of smaller dams with the official aim to produce electricity and irrigate millions of hectares land. But that leads to a simulation of socio-economic and cultural structure of the Kurdish society and destruction of biodiversity in the river ecosystem in a very widespread way. The motivation behind the construction is at the one hand economic, but the demographic change, assimilation and military or so-called security dimension is also very dominant for the most times as both historically and nowadays geography of North Kurdistan plays an important role in the resistance against oppression and colonialism. The most known two dams regarding Turkish state security policy are in, ones in Dersim at the Munza River and the mega dam Lusu at the Tigris River. There are 11 large dams constructed along the Iraqi border which are officially built because of military reasons. They are described in the 2007 annual report of the State Water Agency as a border security reasons dams. Their security dams are concentrated in three regions with the aim of making it difficult for Kurdish guerrillas to cross the official 380 kilometer long Turkey-Iraq border. The dams also serve the state's resettlement policies. Turkish state water policy play a big role in the drying out of large parts of the middle and lower Mesopotamia by storing huge amounts of water behind dams in its territory and using water as a weapon. The people in Syria and Iraq suffer from water shortage for agriculture and drinking. They have started to leave their agrarian lands and move to cities. The whole ecosystem in this wide region have been detrimentally affected by the Turkish state transboundary water politics. In 2020, <coughs> pardon, Elisu Dam has flooded 12,000 years old settlement Hesenkif that has outstanding value in human history within 199 villages and around 80,000 inhabitants were forcibly displaced. The last big natural river system with Turkish state border has been destroyed with millions of species. The plane of Erdur is threatened by the construction of the hydroelectric power planet close to Kar Sarkamish at the Aras River. This plain along the Armenian border is one of the most important agrarian regions in the North Kurdistan. Besides this, agriculture, animal husbandry, and ecosystem have been detrimentally affected. 10,000 of the fishes in the large Van Lake have died because the spawning areas at the inflow of important rivers have been destroyed by several constructed dams. At the north side of the one lake, several dams would flood areas where the, the bones of thousands of people killed by the Turkish state during the Zilin massacre in 1930s. And the evidence of massacre and memory of the victims will be covered up by the same dam. To understand and security motivation of the state, with the flooding or drying of the settlements along rivers in North Kurdistan, more than a half a million people have been displaced directly. 
but several hundred thousand more people around the Diamond Lakes suffer economically and are forced to leave their homes to big cities where they become fully part of the capitalist economy. In economic terms, only the state, a number of big companies from the West Turkey, as well as some companies and big landowners from the North Kurdistan benefit from the dams, not the local population and nature, that pay have prices through economic marginalization, displacement, assimilation, and destruction in various ways. Concerning mining and extractivism, the extraction of the elements in more known words exploiting mineral resources in North Kurdistan has achieved the level of looting and plundering in the last years. Currently, this focuses on the province of Dersim, where 145 mining projects in planning and preparation are. Just a few months ago, 85 kilometers long and up to 3,500 3, meters high, Munzer Mountains, which has unique ecosystems, have been declared completely mining area. It is considered that if the en entire Munzer Mountains, where one of the world's cleanest water resources are located, is declared a mining area, major migration may occur. In the northern Munzer Mountains, there is a mine used in the production of the rocket explosives. The southern mountains have been opened for the gold mining. The Munzur Valley is within the borders of the national park. Hundreds of endemic species grow in this valley, and hundreds of animal species live there. If all these mines become operational, all these species and plants will disappear. Nearly 60 mining companies and around Hakkari have been operating illegally without any legal authorization. The state doesn't allow to intervene in the area in any way due to security reasons. In Farkin, district of the Amit province, the existence of the shale gas, which is known as the extraction of methane gas trapped in the broad structure of the underground and trapped in the rocks at deeps by hydroelectric explosion and water filled with chemicals, which discovered nine years ago. After the detection phase, the drilling is planned at 3,000 different points. Shale gas and oil production will both consume and pollute clean water to the last drop. Shale gas production will threaten agricultural lands at the highest level and make agricultural production impossible in the region. Along with human beings, other living forms will also be severely affected. The Jinner Group, known to close the government, has been building a coal-fired thermal power plant on the slopes of Judy Mountain for about six years. The fact that the workers employed here are prisoners brought from China, plunders nature while at the same, at the same time exploiting the labor of prisoners from the other countries as cheap labor. In 2016, 5,000 decades of pasture land benefiting five neighborhoods of Urfa's central Karakupru district was turned into a stone and sand quarry. Limak Holding, which wanted to use the pasture land in this fertile region where agriculture intensively practices as a mining quarry, didn't give up the project even though it received reaction from the public. With the scope of the project, 15 million pistachio trees and animal husbandry will be detrimentally affected. The local people previously donated the pasture land to the state for afforestation, but the state changed its qualification and allocated to Limak. In 2014, a huge thermal power planet project was planned to build, but had to be postponed due to resistance of the people of Judea. In addition to the three-unit power planet project in Silopi, this project is aimed to be implemented in the middle of the Judy. Over 100 military posts of various forms have been built in order to depopulate the region and to provide security for the mines that produce 1.2 million of tons of coal annually. Deforestation. The first politically motivated forest fire in connection with the displacement and resettlement policy of Kurds within the framework of the Eastern Reform Plan took place in 1925 during the massacre after the provocation of Sheikh Said. 
The Turkish state implemented a similar policy during the Dersim genocide of 1938 and continued it from the 90s onwards. According to official records of the Turkish state, between 1994-99, the Turkish state burned 33 forests and destroyed 9,000 hectares of forest. While the crimes of ecocide are increasing day by day, the legal and security apparatus of the state encourage and protect the plunderer and their business. In the geography of Kurdistan, we are witnessing different phase of the policy of the massacre in addition to rent policies. The burning and evacuation of village, which started in the 90s, and is a different phase of the war concept continues today with forest burning. In addition to the destruction of the forest through forest fires, for the last two years, 30% of the forest area of the region has been cut down and transported by trucks to wood markets in Turkey, mainly in the areas of Shirnak, Judi, Besta, by so-called village gardens, paramilitary unit of Turkish army, rangers, and their networks, with the instruction of the law enforcement forces. Against this, a large Judi march was organized with the participation of various environmental, ecological, women's and democracy organizations from Kurdistan and Turkey. The <coughs> destruction of the historical and cultural sites and habitats. One of the sacred places of the belief of the Kurdish Alavi people in Dersim, Halvori Gizeleri, also has a historical significance due to massacre of the Dersim 37 and 38. The place which has three sacred sites within its borders is also placed uh, where the people of the Dersim, including women, elderly, and children, were massacred in the 1937 and 8. It is historical memory, to, memory of the Dersim people. Halvori Gazeleri, located in Munzur Valley, is an absolute protection area according to National Parks Law Number 2872 and the National Parks Regulation. Despite this system of values, the state and related interest groups are trying to violate the cultural values of the region and carry out the hotel projects. One of the most important sites of history and social memory that has been subjected to destruction by the Elusudem is Hassan Kiev, a civilization, cultural, and historical heritage of the thousands of years. Although it is on the UNESCO cultural heritage list, it was submerged along with 199 villages and ag agricultural lands. The hydroelectric power plant projects planned for the Zilan stream in Erdish in 2014 have resumed despite the Council of State decision to step them, stop them. Today, despite the existing judicial decision and the lack of the environmental impact assessment report, the ecological and cultural heritage of Zilan stream continues to be destroyed and collective memory is being arrested. Hafsel Gardens, which was included World Heritage List by UNESCO in 2015, along with the historic walls of the Diyarbakir, has a history of 80,000 years and is an oxy oxygen supply for the city. It has an aquatic ecosystem, is home to uh, 51 fish species, 20 of them is endemic. It also has a forest ecosystem and has a wide variety of the tree species. Despite this regulation, in 2016, this area was declared a special project area by the ministry and structures such as nation garden, cafes, observation terrace, asphalt and concrete road were started to be built. For the cafe alone, 1,095 square meters of green space has been destroyed. Again, orchards are being uprooted and turned into cafes and business places. Many endemic planet and animal species are threatened with extinction. In cities, especially Diyarbakir, Sur, Jizre, where many neighborhoods were demolished during the self-governance resistance and many neighborhoods were evacuated, the people who had previously migrated from the village to city as a result of the state pressure in the 1990s are now being forced to migrate through urban transfer, uh, transformation, uh, transformation projects. 
the state is trying to sell Toki buildings resembling half open prisons, which are not suitable for the historical social texture of the localities in the cities. To people at the price of millions of liras to the neighborhoods, they have no financial purchasing power. As if being affected by the forest fires and the tree filling were not enough, will creatures from wild goats, <coughs> deer from Dersim to Bingle are being slaughtered all over the country. In 2016 and 17, the expulsion of the Kurdish civil servants and workers from the public sector by emergency decrease and seizure of the wealth of middle and upper income Kurds are among the indicators of the economic dimension of the destruction. <clears throat> the latest addition to this ecological crisis is the use of chemical weapons in the region. It has been announced that Turkey has used chemical weapons and Bennett bombs 2,467 times so far in the federated Kurdistan region of Iraq against Kurdish guerrillas since April 2017, resulting in <clears throat> death of the 44 Kurdish guerrillas. While the war has direct impact on the soil and climate, the chemical weapons mixing into the soil and water poses a, a serious risk to living beings. For this reason, these weapons will kill not only humans and animals, but also vegetation in the region, completely destroy the ecosystem of the region where they are used. In this sense, the massacre of the nature carried out in the geography of Kurdistan are also massacres of the Kurdish history and national values. It has also turned into a policy that is implemented with the framework of the complete special war strategy that also affects the nature of human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you, you Najmettin, for this uh, great opening uh, and, and comprehensive opening to our panel. Our second speaker is Harriet Friedman, and Harriet is a food system analyst, Professor, em Professor Emerita at the University of Toronto. Harriet says, I use, a, I use food as a lens to engage with social and natural sciences and different ways of knowing. The 500-year history of commodity frontiers has also inspired diasporic creativity, which points towards trajectories towards place-based renewal of biocultural landscapes and cuisines within Gaia. So um, please welcome Harriet for our second talk of the panel. Well, in contrast <laughs> to that horrific uh, story, um, I have t titled my, my talk, Regenerating the Gardens of Gaia. Putting this question of ecocide into um, the history of the earth is what can allow us, including for water, to think about how a regeneration can happen. Uh, so I'll just tell a little bit of a story about what's happening now. A full view of Earth's systems is that the atmosphere is kept in balance because pa gases pass through the bodies of living beings. Digging and burning the fossil fuels, the fossil bodies of our ancestors, and cutting living forests disrupt that balance. We are all made of carbon. Carbon becomes pollution only when it is out of balance. The biosphere is as crucial to the flow of gases in the air as those are to life. James Lovelock. Slow down. Slow down. Oh, I'll never get through it. <laughs> OK. Um, and Lynn Margulis named this view of Earth after an ancient Greek goddess, Gaia. This means we should switch criteria for good politics away from carbon, which is reductionist. Carbon is, after all, part of all living things, including you and me, and it's part of the liveliness of each place on Earth. Attention to intensive livestock production combines climate chaos with ecocide. After decades of ignoring the critics of the agricultural system, especially livestock, 
uh, the agri-food industries finally showed up at both climate talks and biodiversity talks in the fall of 2022. Social movements, which had formerly focused on mining and burning fossil fuels, suddenly discovered that meat diets are ecocidal. Intensive livestock factories emerged only after World War II. For thousands of years, humans have co-evolved with animals and shaped every landscape on Earth, as they still do in many places. Animal factories removed livestock from millennial ways of grazing grass, foraging forests, and eating waste in households and villages. They confined animals that fattened quickly into vast factories, so required feed industries, which in turn required vast monocultures of maize and soy, which in turn kick-started the whole thing through US government subsidies for maize and soy. Once large enough, feed crop monocultures grew rapidly and spread to Brazil, Argentina, and other places. Monocultures are linear systems which necessarily deplete and pollute. They rely on fossil inputs for fuel, fertilizer, and pesticides, all of which unbalance gases in the atmosphere. Basically, if we can solve the biodiversity problem, solve the ecological problem, the atmosphere problem will take care of itself. They deplete monocultures, deplete distant phosphate mines and oil fields. They pollute soils and waterways with manure that cannot replenish soils, as it should, and nitrogen runoff that creates dead zones. They drastically narrow the genetic base of plants and animals. The broken ecological links are replaced by flows of money. Today's monocultures culminate a long history of successive commodity frontiers, a term I take from Jason Moore. These began with sugar 500 years ago and now extend to every part of the world and every commercial crop. Since the 1990s, these include palm plantations, farmed fish, and standardized vegetables, which displace diverse and enduring landscapes, and the humans whose knowledge of natural cycles shaped enduring biocultural landscapes. Monocultural soy and maize are among the handful of internationally traded agricultural commodities. In the 21st century, finance capital created commodity index funds, one of their creative inventions uh, leading to that crisis. Um, these commodity index funds link global, global prices of soy, maize, wheat, and palm oil with those of minerals and fossil fuels. What is meant by a food crisis is a rise in prices for those traded grains, not for broccoli. Uh, then came the turn of farmers as finance became interested in farmland and land grabs began. They were not interested in farmers or landscapes. Part of the problem is measuring the abstract idea of food in categories that are equally abstract, like calories. Consider food we think is concrete until if you try to imagine going into a shop or a restaurant and asking for food. You have to say what you want, right? Food is concrete and it is created by cultures that create cuisines. Just as intensive livestock created soy and maize deserts in what were once diverse forest, grasslands, and other ecosystems, now rivers and oceans are simplified with aquaculture, doing to waters what has long been done to the land. It is therefore not surprising that eating a vegan diet has become a touchstone for ecological awareness, especially among the young. No doubt eating less meat eating less of the products of an ecocidal livestock complex is a good thing, rather like driving electric cars is better than driving ones driven, powered by gasoline. Still, without understanding how the ecocide of the livestock complex fits into the larger system, such actions can have perverse consequences. Ecocide from intensive livestock is deeply entangled with ultra-processed foods. These include those labeled healthy. Health foods is an interesting concept. <laughs> Didn't need it before there were industrial foods. 
Uh, it very much includes substitutes that imitate meat, such as soy proteins. Ultra-processed food means industrial food made in factories with substitutable ingredients. It is not the ancient preservation of cheese or yogurt or sauerkraut, which can be, and for most of history was, and sometimes still is, artisanal. Ultra-processed food has to be made in factories, and the first one that was important is margarine. In the 19th century, it was made from animal fat because that was what was extra. Uh, but farmers objected to imitation butter, which was cheaper, and they succeeded in advocating for rules forbidding that it pretend to be like butter uh, by using colors and words like butter. After World War II, margarine manufacturers switched to vegetable oils, and then they really grew. Margarine grew by using cheap byproducts of soy and maize from animal feed industries. After extracting what was wanted to feed confined animals, byproducts could be broken down and recombined in what appear to be very diverse products that are actually made of very few ingredients. Direct subsidies from the US government, which are still in place, uh, for livestock feeds also indirectly subsidize ultra-processed edible commodities. Soy and maize can be separated into starches, oils, and sweeteners, such as high fructose corn syrup, and recombined into apparent diversity. Adding a touch of broccoli and spice, they allow prol proliferation of edible commodities on supermarket shelves. This kind of manipulation was first possible, of course, because of US government subsidies. Margarine led the way to all ultra-processed foods which proliferate now in corporate labs. All use substitutable categories, fats, sweeteners, starches, derived from deconstructed plants and recombined with substances, mainly chemicals, called flavors and textures. Also very odd words like mouthfeel that they use to describe it. Like the agronomists that guide monocultures, nutritionists whose professional journals were until recently openly sponsored by Kraft and General Foods, guided the abstract measures of calories and proteins and even vitamins. By reducing health to a list of categories, gaps led to chronic illnesses, uh, which these take a long time to make people sick. The World Health Organization declared an obesity epidemic, including in the Global South, in 2003. A supplements industry grew up to sell missing micronutrients because of diets that had focused only on calories and proteins. Rates of other chronic diet-related diseases, such as colon cancer, are rising especially quickly among young people. All of these, of course, create profit opportunities mainly for pharmaceuticals, which is now at the center of the food industry. Once established, soy and maize monocultures could move to other countries, famously destroying the Amazon rainforest. Then different monocultures could substitute. Most important is palm oil, which began in the 1990s to destroy forest ecosystems and cultures, first in Asia, then in Latin America. They finally returned to West Africa, which was the original site of domestication of palm, and where farmers still use it for cooking, winemaking, and ceremonies. At the same time, supermarkets moved in uh, to promote a shift from circular to linear systems, that is, from local markets, mixed farmings, and cultural cuisines to industrial packaged commodities. Now food manufacture is poised for a much more dramatic substitution of ingredients. All these industries have learned ever better rhetoric. The language of feeding the world means the world of humans at the expense of living cultural landscapes. The pesticide industry calls itself crop life. Mergers of the 1980s reorganized agri-food industry, including newly patented seeds, into a complex that calls itself the life sector. They really do. They have some good language. However, the rise of environmental awareness provides different rhetoric for an emerging and competing sector that calls itself meat alternatives. They don't mean lentils. 
ultra-processed foods, which began with the livestock complex, now seek to displace livestock entirely with new factories. Rapidly emerging alternative proteins deepen ultra-processing. It's therefore crucial not to fall into the trap of supporting a different set of capitalist corporations. Alternative meat industries are led by engineers who combine genetic with digital technologies and celebrate Silicon Valley ideas of disruption and innovation. And in fact, much of the venture capital comes from Silicon Valley. Tapping into growing awareness of the ecocidal dangers of factory meat, engineers who got rich with digital technologies want to move production entirely into factories. Beginning with venture capital, and at first subsidized by states without a land base, there's an important geopolitical dimension to this, especially Singapore, Israel, and the Gulf states, Investors now include giant corporations, Exxon, as well as Bayer and Monsanto. Cloned meat and fish reduce genetic diversity far beyond the damage that was done by the livestock industries. Precision fermentation, which is not yogurt, <laughs> um, fermentation is very ancient. Precision fermentation, with almost no resemblance to tradition, uh, uses microorganisms that reproduce in vats without sunlight or air using technologies developed in the U.S. space program for astronauts, just like the internet. They create an extrusion, a substance, that can be shaped to imitate everything from scrambled eggs to curry to lasagna. Corporate laboratories threaten to deepen the corporate control over what might be called ultra ultra-processed foods. They cultivate a type of consumer called flexitarian. And it's important that so much of our language that seems good, because there's so many artists and writers who come up with it, uh, that they really uh, are spin. So ultra-processed foods are really class diets. It's all the food that the poor can afford and it's contaminated by pesticides, hormones, and antibiotics. These aspects of the livestock industry could be solved, perhaps, by moving all food into factories, but the expense would be deepening class divisions for diet and health. Diet-related chronic diseases are understandably concentrated among the poor. Of course, agriculture is only one source of ecocide, along with mining and timber and other extractive industries. Partly I'm talking about it because it's what I know. But mostly, if humans are part of nature, then getting food is what we share with all other animals. We have to eat, and we want to eat. How we get what we eat makes all the difference. Of course, there's an alternative. Experiments abound in growing, preparing, marketing, and sharing healthy food from healthy farms, of relocalizing social and ecological relations. Agroecology, permaculture, urban agriculture, biodynamic farming are everywhere from Germany to China to Brazil to Malawi. To making, getting, and sharing food once again the foundation for living well in each place and in all places, requires reversing the domination of finance. It means connecting across places to coordinate and support each other. It means remaking landscapes and social relations and creating bottom-up ways of governing ourselves. This links politics of food with conservation, and I really want to alert you to this new um, kind of formation of power and of opposition. The links, um, conservation has a sordid colonial history. The World Wildlife Fund began to protect African lions so English hunters could shoot them. It continued as enclosures of landscape, and does continue, as enclosures of landscapes inhabited by indigenous people, from the Himalayas to the Amazon to southern Africa. A particular view of rewilding a fashionable word of the moment, is to evict forest dwellers, sacrifice their intimate knowledge, and manage from afar using abstract and limited scientific ideas. As for centuries, 
evicted inhabitants are turned by law into poachers and trespassers. Rewilding thus leads to violence against land and water protectors. The idea of wilderness itself could only emerge as a result of enclosures. The rich are able to enjoy forests and waterways. The most recent version is ecotourism, inviting a few evicted indigenous individuals to serve as guides and as guards of so-called protected areas, meaning protected from humans, from their evicted inhabitants. One contrast to these false approaches is called Convivial Conservation. It's a book by Busher and Fletcher. They want, from Verso Press, they want to rescue the word conservation to mean preserving together. Living together means decolonizing and demonetizing, the opposite of schemes to save nature by cre creating fictitious markets for what are called environmental services, which is what the Convention on Biodiversity does. Conviviality draws on liberatory ideas from Ivan Illich. It encompasses both new conservationists, as they call themselves, and indigenous peoples whose languages, such as Buen Vivir, express human inter intention to cooperate with all beings in thriving ecosystems. If nature is to flourish with people as part of it, then modernist division of spaces into urban, rural, and wild must go. Cities are beginning to rewild, and urban farming is blossoming. Farmers are rewilding, that is, they are stopping to kill predators of livestock and learning to live with them. So-called wild places can rehumanize. The goal is to balance human needs with needs of greater than human nature. To do so requires also to subordinate economy to Gaia, to make food getting and other human activities serve conviviality, to help human life thrive by deeply embedding societies and biocultural landscapes. Justice is key. Busher and Fletcher suggest a basic income to encourage stewardship, to support inhabitants to stay on, using their knowledge and that of ecological sciences to stay and nourish all our relations, to regenerate damaged ecosystems, and to create ways for humans and other beings to eat, to cycle wastes, to flourish together. It means redistribution of wealth and new institutions to replace private property, perhaps commons, perhaps as in parts of West Africa, combining customary tenure with equality for women and youth. No single solution can shift from ecocide to regeneration. Instead, step-by-step -step changes allow for discovery of paths forward and for course correction as mistakes are seen. The goal is to subordinate what's called economy, that is, ways of working and sharing, to life. It is useful to replace reductionist thinking about carbon and ecosystem services with holistic thinking. Water, instead of being dammed, is a brilliant candidate for thinking about how to regenerate the earth, the gardens of Gaia. Water, like carbon, is crucial to life, but water circles and flows in ways that model how to reshape human societies ecologically. Every molecule of water exists in one place at any moment, yet changes form from liquid to ice to vapor as it flows up, down, and around. This is a very big idea, so let me give an example from my own bioregion, the Great Lakes of North America. The Great Lakes are one of the largest bodies of fresh water in the world. They are connected in one direction to the Mississippi River, which flows into the Caribbean Sea, and in another direction to the St. Lawrence River, which flows into the Atlantic Ocean. The water nourishes landscapes and peoples across a vast area. It evaporates into clouds, falls as rain and snow, and supports life in many climates. I'd hope to show a PowerPoint, uh, which is an image of the Great Lakes from space. It's very beautiful, green and blue with clouds. Uh, and then a map, which shows a red line through the Great Lakes that is the border between the United States and Canada. Farms and forests surrounding lakes on both sides of the border and the rivers, lakes, and streams that feed them and flow out from them are contested by indigenous peoples who have for two centuries 
been evicted, killed, and concentrated into small areas called reservations or reserves. If nature is to flourish with people as part of it, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> did that, been there, done that, an effort to link divided elements is called the Great Lakes Commons. As an indigenous friend put it, the way to reconciliation between settlers and indigenous people is through mutual connections to a third element, the land. The Great Lakes Commons offers walks led by indigenous elders and dialogue about what the claim, the demand for land back could realistically mean in landscapes deeply degraded by two centuries of colonial activities and with many more inhabitants. Participants on both sides of the border, which of course isn't recognized by indigenous language and history, its manifesto is in English, French, and Mohawk. It anticipates a bioregional landscape shaped as it was before colonization but what, by what the generous earth and waters provide. Humans are part of nature. Like other animals, we are what we eat, and we all live from the earth. We protect what we love. Regenerating Gaia in each place depends on falling in love. Cree artist and scholar Thompson Highway says, it means learning to laugh together. Thank you, Harriet. And before we move on, we have to take a short break. I was told that there's a problem with live stream and they restarted the system and it takes a little bit of time. So until we get the okay that the live stream is up and running, uh, we will just wait. Uh, but in the meantime, our, our third speaker has a presentation, a set of slides, I was told. So maybe we can, exactly. Um, it's not it's not a break break so please if you're going out please be back soon because we don't want to lose the audience <laughs> that's great thank you I learned a lot I, my master thesis was on the the first speaker in age the, the uh, ecology uh, 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 uh. Uh, it was interesting that really this uh, very very European academic traditional that 